Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York. A curious contradiction confronts us involving one of the city's most magnificent monuments, the Brooklyn Bridge. It's inspired countless artists and authors and anyone who's ever strolled its splendid promenade. We know its grandeur intimately. Not so for the man who designed it, John Roblin. Until now. Engineering America, the first biography of Roebling in 75 years. It presents a man bursting with ideas on everything from science to seances, a genius and a quack. Richard Haw is the author. You'll meet him next. Richard Hall, welcome to the program. Nice Thank to you. Have it's you. great to be here. Uh, Richard is a uh, associate professor at John Jay College. He's already written two books about the Brooklyn Bridge, and Engineering America is his first biography. And it's meticulously researched. Uh, Richard, you give us a John Roebling, who is a man of a million ideas, a dozen an hour, uh, but also a man of, a, of startling contradiction. Uh, before we talk about his genius, let's talk about some of his oddities. I think that when I started this project, I really wanted to understand who John Roebling was. I wanted to understand who this genius was, this man who had dreamed up and created the vision for one of the greatest engineering feats of the 19th century, the Brooklyn Bridge. And who, who was it that had sort of got to this point in his career and was able to build suspension bridges longer than anybody else, incorporate great design into them, uh, solve so many engineering problems. Um, and I sort of, I, I wanted to understand his genius, but I also knew that he was a, a man who was on some level a quack, but he had um, a lot of strange ideas about medicine, about science, about religion, about the afterlife. Um, and I think that, um, I, I suppose you start these projects thinking that, these things will be sort of fun and interesting and you learn so much on the way and where i am now is it's easy to think of him as a quack but he was really a man of his time uh, the things that he believed in like the afterlife spiritualism the water cure uh, all sorts of um other ideas odic force um which i won't try to explain here but you can google yeah. it um were, were often current beliefs wide-ranging beliefs spiritualism is a good is a very good example of this uh, and I make quite a lot of it towards the end of the book as a way to think about John. Um, almost everyone was into spiritual spiritualism. I think I have a phrase in the book that probably more people believed in spiritualism in the 19th century than they than believed in suspension bridges. Yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, politicians. I mean, talk, I mean, some of these, some of a man of his time, and, and I should emphasize that the title of the book is um, the life and times of of John Roebling and the times, the 19th century, I mean, medicine was in its infancy. They, they knew very little, uh, you know, it's hard to imagine now how little they knew then. Yeah, well, it, it might be even exaggerating to say it was in its infancy. Um, there was very few real established medical guidelines. I think New York State, for example, made it easier to be a doctor uh, in the 1850s, they took away some of the sort of rules and regulations about being becoming a doctor. All you had to really do was stick out a shingle and say, I'm a doctor. Um, so the, the medical profession was sort of really nowhere. Uh, yeah. so John's idea about, med about medicine um, were no more crazy than most established, uh, established doctors. Uh, he did, uh, I think one of the things that sort of fascinated me is this, is, is the water cure and so you have this man who can wrestle thousands of tons of granite and steel and lumber into these incredibly intricate and beautiful bridges. But he also believed that if you wrapped yourself in a wet sheet every night, it would somehow bring out all the bad humors inside of your body. Mm. And yeah. um, the water cure is a fascinating part of the 19th century because it's one of those things that the actual ideas itself don't really work in any sort of medical sense. But the water cure involves you often sort of going out into these sort of spas, getting away from the city, eating balanced meals, going, having exercise, drinking lots of water. Um, 
And so they often sort of worked. In his case, if I'm, if I'm understanding the water cure correctly, it, it proved fatal because when he, when he had that freak accident, uh, you know, at the bridge site and, and eventually developed, you know, with his foot uh, losing some toes and developed mm -hmm. uh, tetanus, he kept his foot in a, in a basin of cold water thinking that was going to be the cure. And it was. It was, uh, it he, he was. He was a man who stuck to his beliefs quite rigidly through much of his life. The water cure is very popular in the 1840s. It becomes less popular in the 1850s and 60s. Uh, but John stuck with it uh, throughout his life. And I think, again, when I sort of, there's a sort of, there's a sort of Stockholm syndrome to being a biographer. The more you spend time with people, you sort of start to understand them more and you become sympathetic and almost try and excuse them. But there is something about John Roebling. When I first started out, I thought, oh, what a fool. He like contracted tetanus and treated it with the water cure. But there's also, there is no vaccine for tetanus when he, when he gets it. There isn't a lot of things he could have done. What he did was no more actually foolish than any other doctor would, would have done. But again, it's that sense of understanding your biographical subject when you start thinking, oh, that was foolish. And you yeah, come to yeah. an understanding of the times. And again, and I think this is why the sort of contextual or the life and times are important is unless you know really the state of medicine at the time, it's really hard to understand the decisions people make. Um, exactly, of course. He, 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 he ate charcoal every day. He, he refused to eat most fruit and vegetables. But the spiritualism, which was, which was very big in the 19th century, he, was a, he believed in seances. He, he did. The way I think about it with him, he was, really was a seeker. Uh, and he believed in things. He wanted to solve problems. And something like the afterlife, he couldn't, I don't, he wasn't capable of saying, oh, you, you just die. Um, there had to be something else there. There had to be, there's always, for him, everything was a problem to be solved, an idea to be found. And I think that's what's really interesting about the 19th century. The 19th century is really a time of tremendous exploration in all sorts of different um, branches of knowledge. And there's a real belief that answers can be found in the 19th century. And John, bought that on, on every level. He felt that people could be perfected, society be, could be perfected. Well, he was after, I think you put it, uh, I think the way you write it is that you're, this is a man who, who wanted to bind the nation together and in division, who, who, mm -hmm. who thought his work and, and, and uh, inspiring others could create that more perfect union that we read about in the preamble to the Constitution. Yes, I mean, he thought that in all sorts of ways. He was a man who believed that the world was heading towards harmony and sort of perfection, and it would be achieved through uh, technological means on some level, so that he was a big fan of railroads, he was a big fan of the Atlantic Cable. He felt that the more we became neighbors, the more we became connected. He thought railroads would bring democracy to Russia, for example, um, because it would bind people together and it would make uh, neighbors and friends out of strangers. We would have less greed and avarice. Uh, he said at one point that the almighty dollar will lose its charm for people. And we would learn to sort of, through technology and through sort of social interaction, would become a sort of flat egalitarian society uh, where all the sort of divisions, either racial or economic, would melt away in the face of our understanding of each other and our shared humanity. Yeah, you, you uh, include a quote from him, from his writing. Um, and this is what Roebling said, if man cannot be forced in harmony with nature, then we are led to conclude there is something essentially wrong in the government of the world. Mm. Boy, I'd like to have him around today. <laughs> well, he, he didn't think that things like that never made sense to him. The world itself, couldn't be badly constructed. It had to have a purpose. Everything in the world had to have a purpose. Something had, it had to be there for a reason. Well, you and also quote him uh, or include from his writing, uh, you know, exactly what you're talking about. Roebling saying, the greatest problem of all is reconstruction of society on the principles of humanity. Yeah. Uh, exactly what you're talking about. The, 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 the technology, the science that he was a master of. Mm -hmm. and building bridges that connected people yeah. uh, with, with, morale, with, a, with what he considered morality. Yeah. Uh, 
and for example, he was fervently, I mean, here we're talking 19th century, and, and at the time, slavery, a very big issue in this, this country, and he was fervently opposed. He was, and he was from the very beginning, which is somewhat less surprising for someone who was sort of born and raised in German-speaking uh, Europe, where slavery really didn't have any sort of uh, hold. But the abolition movement is not a major force in the U.S. at the time, so it is really quite, these are quite outspoken views to be having in 1831, perhaps less so, say, 20 years later when slavery is starting to uh, create mm -hmm. all sorts of chaos around the country. Um, but he is really, in, in terms of uh, America, he is very much ahead of public opinion on this. And he says uh, at one point, which I think is kind of interesting, that I mean, he, say, he comes to America about a month before Nate Turner's rebellion. Uh, and he says in his diary, like, sometime soon, these enslaved people are going to rise up and attack their masters. And he says, and I, for one, wish them well. And he's incredibly despairing of the South as a sort of economic and political entity. Um, and he has some really awful, not awful, but some really critical things to say about the South uh, throughout his life. We're talking about a man, and you present us a man in your book, of uh, great morality and great interest in this whole concept, this unity and the perfection mm -hmm. of the union. And I, I'm a little reluctant to turn this into a, 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 you know, a referendum on our times, but I mean, we're living in a time of great division, mm -hmm. uh, especially brought on us, uh, imposed on us from Washington. I mean, there is nothing more uh, startling, I think, than a president of the United States uh, uh, condemning immigrants, condemning foreigners, uh, doing everything it seems in his possession, uh, it is in his power to, to divide people. Where, yeah. You know, I'd like to have Robles, I really, I, he seems like a man for our time. Well, he was, um, yeah, he, he was, he was, a, he was a man of his time. So he was not without his failings and prejudices in all sorts of ways. But he was an immigrant and understood what it was like to be a stranger in a land. Uh, he, 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 was, he had some really interesting ideas about immigrants and say things like immigrant newspapers, which he thought that um, it, would do, it would do a really good job for the US to learn other languages. Uh, and so he, when he talked about having sort of German language newspapers, he thought they should be in English and German um, and that people should learn to read German and that Germans should learn to read English. Um, mm -hmm. And he thought, again, that would help with people sort of understanding each other, the sort of the division of foreignness would go away if you could communicate. Let's yeah. talk about his, let's talk about his, I guess, great, we, we, we would agree that his greatest um, accomplishment is the Brooklyn Bridge, is, is that fair? Yes, well, the Brooklyn Bridge is a sort of a somewhat complicated uh, question for him. He designs it, it yeah, it's his vision, he comes up with uh, the Gothic, uh, he, the, the, the aesthetics, um, and the sort of vision with the central walkway and the cable structure, all the things that we love about the Brooklyn Bridge as people, uh, that we, we love it as an aesthetic object and as a public space, as a sort of intrinsic New York space. Those things are his, but of course, he died very early in the construction of it and his son um, built it. So it's really sort of a Roebling um, combo um, but thing. I, but, yeah, as you point out, the, uh, you know, he didn't get to build it, um, but it's his, it's his creation, it's his concept. And um, th it's a unifier. I mean, it, brought, it, it connected two of the biggest cities in the United States at the two, time. Two right? of the four, yeah. It brought them together. And, uh, and it's a magnificent, you know, architecturally magnificent, as, as opposed to some of the buildings we see being erected in the, you know, all over town today that seem to me to be no more than massive uh, expressions of the ego of the builder. Well, they're, they're, also, they're also designed in an incredibly cost-conscious manner. They want to create a maximum amount of space for the least amount uh, of money. Um, and I think that something like the Brooklyn Bridge, um, I just want to say the unifying thing, that the interesting thing about as soon as the day the Brooklyn Bridge is open, the newspapers start to talk about when will the city be unified. Uh, and there's an article, I think, in, um, I forget which, which newspaper it is, but uh, now that the two greatest cities in this region are linked, uh, how far can it be before you know, the consolidation of the five boroughs, which happened uh, 20 odd years, 25 years later, I think. Um, so it's it sort of, the Brooklyn Bridge is really the first um, 
moment when uh, we start to think, oh, maybe we're going to actually have a unified city of New York rather than um, the various uh, parts of the metropolitan area. This is a magnificent, a beautiful structure uh, and reminds us of a time when we built important structures beautifully. As yes. Where we uh, don't that, seem to be doing that now. No, I mean, it, it, it's in the same lineage with the, Ro with the Rockefeller Center and uh, Grand Central Terminal and Pennsylvania uh, before then, which is, of course, demolished. Um, and it was Pennsylvania Station that started the sort of preservation movement, uh, really. And I think that, um, yeah, it is, it is a, it's, it's a, there's a sort of, it's, it's, as I said before, it's, it's an incredible aesthetic object. It's a great, but it's a great public space. It's where, I mean, you go on it any day of the week, even during the pandemic, I went for a couple of walks on it and it was still really crowded, even in March when we're all supposed to be at home and in the lockdown. And uh, people were still out on the bridge. It was, it was still a lot of people out there. It's a beloved space. It's a beloved icon. And there's something about the interaction between it as a place and it as an aesthetic object that seems to draw people. Uh, well, and, and you, you, I think you refer in the book to the double Gothic arches that mm. can be designed as uh, growing out of a medieval desire to, to stretch up toward the divine. And he called them in his own writing, uh, Roebling said, the great towers will be entitled to be ranked as national monuments. Which and they are. Not, officially, they ought to be. <laughs> uh, yeah, they are. They're on the National uh, Historic Register. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's, there's I, I speak about this in the book, but uh, it would be perhaps a bit boring to go on about it too much in the interview. But um, there's a really interesting sort of arc to John's life as a sort of architect or as a designer, an aesthetic designer rather than just an engineer. Um, and I think that the Brooklyn Bridge in that regard is the, really the culmination uh, of this. Um, and the way that the sort of simplicity of the towers, but also the various points of it, the, the, the buttresses that move, that move our gaze up, but help raise the, the, the building up. Uh, mm -hmm. and the Gothic arches, everything is sort of, it, it leads us up to the top and the cables, the way the cables work with the towers as well. The cables, when you, there's nothing more magnificent, I think, almost in the world than that moment when you walk towards the towers and you're encased in those cables, that sort of spider web of cables. Exactly. And they lead up towards that tower. And, and it, it the, the, so sort of functions as almost a sort of quasi-religious experience, but also as a gateway leading into New York. It's a really perfect way to walk into, into New York. Um, and much in the same way that Grand Central is. It's, uh, someone sort of said, when you come to Grand Central through, uh, if you come to New York through Grand Central, you enter like a king. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think when he said, when you come through Penn Station, you enter like a rat. Um, <laughs> but um, but it's, it's a really beautiful way to walk into Manhattan. You feel it's, 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 it's quasi-religious, it's sort of regal. Um, the, way, uh, the way the whole structure plays together um, it's just, it's, just a, it's, it's a profoundly yeah, it's, aesthetic experience. Yeah, the promenade, as you've been talking about, is just a magnificent, uh, maybe the maybe the most perfect part of that design that, that it it is. And, and, and people could walk across and be in, enveloped by that bridge and, of course, the, the, the vistas around them. I, you know, we, we talked and, and a little while ago. Roebling, Roebling built that into his, uh, the, his, his uh, initial proposal to build the bridge. He talked about uh, the promenade as being a sort of a way to escape the city, get a view, get some fresh air. He saw, he saw it as a as a sort of a place that people would go to for a walk, not just. It, it, he didn't see it necessarily as transport from uh, New York to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. As a place that people would purposely go to to have to have a walk, to be out. He saw it. He designed it as a promenade for people to use. Um, not just for, to transfer goods and services or get from one place to another, but as a place of leisure. We talked a little bit earlier about his, uh, his fervent abolition, uh, abolitionist views and uh, brings up the Niagara Gorge Bridge, which was mm. another of his. And uh, I can't even begin to, <laughs> I'm, it's silly for me to say, I can't even begin to imagine how you build that bridge. But... Um, not only did he do it, but it became an important part of the, the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman involved in using that bridge. It did. There's actually, um, there is no evidence that John, that there was a link 
the, there's no evidence that the, the, the link that I'm about to create really existed, uh, except that we know that John was a fervent abolitionist and believed wholeheartedly uh, that slavery was a, a true evil. Um, but he also did, um, it wasn't just the Niagara Bridge as well, it was the Cincinnati Bridge, Covington and Cincinnati Bridge, um, which was built between a northern uh, free state and a slave southern state, uh, mm -hmm. uh, between uh, uh, Co uh, Covington in Kentucky and Cincinnati in Ohio. And there was a lot of interesting sort of racial dimension or slavery dimension to, to that bridge being, uh, being built. It was begun in, uh, or the, the legislation um, was begun in 1846. Um, and it was uh, something that both uh, Northern Kentucky and Southern uh, Ohio really wanted to expand their sort of commercial reach. Covington wanted a piece of Cincinnati's success. Cincinnati wanted access to the sort of Southern Railroad uh, system and therefore mm -hmm. into uh, markets in the South. Um, and so this legislation was discussed and, um, but there was the, the, the sticking point was a slave clause in the, uh, that was written into the legislation in Kentucky that the bridge company would be um, responsible for the cost of any slaves escaping over the bridge into uh, Ohio. Uh, yes. Um, and I mean, when we think about, I mean, the thing that immediately comes to mind is Uncle Tom's Cabin, where Eliza has to flee over the Ohio River to escape slavery. And so um, the Ohio River was really the point at which it was the sort of River Jordan for uh, enslaved Americans. It was uh, much, much as the Niagara uh, Peninsula was uh, to get into Canada. John's two most famous bridges before he gets the Brooklyn Bridge are all sort of potential routes for slaves into a freer, into a freer place. And obviously the Niagara Bridge uh, was opened in 1855. Uh, Cincinnati Bridge is, is, is started around the same time, but not open until after the Civil War. Uh, no. So it actually ends up not playing a part in the story of slavery in the country. Uh, but the Niagara Bridge is open for five years before the Civil War uh, uh, breaks out, six years before the Civil War breaks out. And Frederick Douglass, when he's in Rochester, sends people to Harriet Tubman uh, in Niagara, and she gets them over the bridge. And there's, there's all sorts of documentary. There's a lot of interviews conducted with Harriet Tubman towards the end of her life. Uh, and she talks a lot about all the, the people she took over the bridge on the train or walked over. Before we run out of time, we, we ought to mention that John was quite a successful businessman. And the business was wire rope, which yeah. am, I, am I wrong to, to analogize it or to think of it in terms of like at the Brooklyn Bridge or any place where you see cables, what we call yes. cables. Is that, that's wire rope, right? Yes. Um, he... Okay. Um, uh, Ropes, uh, ropes have been around for millennia, of course, but they're made out of sort of vegetable matter. Um, and they break, snap, rot, you name it. Um, and uh, we start to get wire rope, wire cables developed in Germany in the sort of 1830s, mm -hmm. uh, 1840s, uh, primarily for use in mines. Um, and then they get developed a little bit in uh, England, but there's a lot of people tinkering with this idea. And John hits on the idea. He he uh, spends uh, a lot of time surveying um, railroad lines in Pennsylvania for the state and working on the Pennsylvania Mainline Canal, which is Pennsylvania's uh, response to the Erie Canal. Right. Um, and there is this thing called the Port Allegheny Portage Railroad, which is, is how you get up and down. You get a canal up and down the Allegheny Mountains in the middle of Pennsylvania. And they are, for want of a better phrase, they sort of hauled up mountains uh, and, and drop down mountains uh, and they use uh, hemp ropes to do this. Uh, but they don't last very long and they're very expensive. And so John is sort of working in this area and he, he sees this and, and, he's, and, and of course he's, he's always reading and always thinking uh, and he thinks, well, if we can make that out of spiraled wire, rope, uh, spiraled steel, iron, um, they would last much longer. So he starts to tinker. He's tremendously unsuc unsuccessful initially, but then he, um, he finds his way into the subject and it's, fa it's really fascinating to think about uh, in sort of the early 1840s, he's got all these neighbors of his walking up and down his meadow behind his house with these big complex twisting and turning machines and these huge lengths of wire cable that he's got from uh, Pittsburgh or sort of wire strands, making them into ropes, which then get used on the Allegheny Porter Railroad. They're a huge success. They work really well. Um, and wire ropes, I mean, it's one of those sort of, things again when you start to write a book like this I remember thinking like 
I really was not looking forward to the wire rope chapter. I was like, uh, like this <laughs> well, is going to be a. You know, I he he turns out to turn. Uh, the end of that story, I think, it, it, is that he turns it into a very successful business, and uh, I think we need to reflect, as you have. Uh, this city of skyscrapers wouldn't exist without wire rope, which gives us elevators and therefore high rises and therefore New York City. I know that's, that's the thing that that's what made it more interesting to me. When, I, when you start to think about all the ways in which we, which we use wire rope and which we have wire rope, cable cars, funiculars, um, derricks, oil derricks, um, rigging for ships and uh, everything. I mean, just, the list goes on and on and on. And you, and you say, you can't have skyscrapers without elevators and you can't have elevators without cables. Um, right. And so, and John Robings and Sons uh, Wire Rope Company is really the, the, um, the most significant provider of wire rope in this country to well into the 20th century. We now, we now import nearly all of the wire rope uh, and it made his family hugely wealthy. Um, it was it was a exactly. major major business and it generated huge profits. Fascinating individual, John Roebling, brought to us in full in Engineering America, Richard Hawes book, The Life and Times of John Roebling, a man who wanted to bind our nation together. And I think for the third time, I say, where is he today? We <laughs> need this man today. Richard Hawes, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tony. This has been great. I, I've enjoyed it. Thank you.